morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Grace Church. We're here together to worship God. All right, so I've been thinking you should be worried. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that you manage to see whatever it is you're looking for? Have you ever noticed that? It's a broad statement, I know, but um, but but I want you to think about it because here's what I mean. Sometimes I get up in the morning and it's gloomy and it's raining outside, and I think. This is going to be one lousy day. My hair is going to get all frizzy more than it is. I'm going to be wet running in and out of church all day. So I get out of bed and I go to the coffee maker and I realize no coffee. Well, it figures. I see that's the kind of day it's going to be lousy. It's going to be a lousy day. So I get in my car right? And because it's raining, and because I drive this little car that I call the bean, because it's a tiny little maroon uh, jelly bean, it's close to the ground. When I go through the puddles, the wires underneath get wet, and my battery sputters. (laughs) Lousy car. Lousy car. My frown deepens. I start thinking about car repairs. That's what my day is going to be about today. Probably a hundred bucks for a new car battery figures right on the hands of right 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 on the heels of the hundred bucks I had to spend last week for a stupid oil change so I head to the church right I'm gonna have to deal with Anthony and Rochelle and Kip today They probably have a million problems they want me to solve. Well, they they can just solve all those problems themselves today. Who do they think I am? God? (laughs) Oh, God. Okay, God, God. Oh, yeah, God. I better say a prayer, right? I'm a pastor after all, right? I should spend some time in prayer, right? Let's think about God. Dear God, make this crappy, lousy day better, okay? Would you? In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, enough of that. So I get to church. And there's Kip and Anthony and Kelsey and Rochelle, all smiling and happy, chattering about what God's doing in the jail through our Bible studies, through Choose Recovery and people getting sober, and the grocery store where people are getting fed, and in the kids' department where children are learning to pray. And I start right, and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thanks for sharing. But are you getting any actual work done around here? Have you seen this place? This place is a mess. Oh, God. What a lousy day this is today. So, you ever notice that you tend to see whatever you're looking for? Here's a different thing that sometimes happens to me. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, and it's rainy, and it's gloomy. And I think, oh, thank you, God, for all the water this morning. The flowers need it, and you're getting it out of the way early. I'm so blessed. And then I go to the coffee maker, and I'm out of coffee. And I go, oh, God, you are really a funny guy. How did you know that I could use a Dunkin' Donuts latte today? You are so good to me for giving me an excuse to spend some money to try that new coffee that I've been meaning to try. (laughs) So then I get in my little jelly bean car, and the water gets on the wires, right? And the battery starts sputtering from the puddles, and I say... God, you're just amazing that you get me to church without stalling. (laughs) And praise Jesus, I have a car. And I have a few bucks in the bank just in case I need them. Keep up the blessings, God. And then I begin to think of Anthony, Kip, and Rochelle, and Kelsey, and I get to church, and all the good uh, ministry they're doing, making Jesus real for all sorts of folks. And I thank God again for blessing me with such amazing, passionate staff and leaders. And I pray, let me be a blessing to them today. God, if they have any problems, let me help them do your will today. What an amazing day this is going to be because I can see you clearly in all of it. God, I'm so very blessed. So, You ever notice that you see exactly what you're looking for? The bad news about this is that when I'm looking for lousy everywhere, I'm sure to find it everywhere I look. And the good news about this 
is that when I'm looking for God, that's who I will find everywhere I look. We're in this series of messages called Beyond Happy, where we're talking about what Jesus says are the characteristics of people who experience being blessed by God. And we've been using this definition of blessed for several weeks. It's on the screen. Let's say it together like we've been doing every week so far. Go, blessed, made happy by God through total dependence on God. See, Jesus gives his greatest sermon ever. It's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And in this long sermon, and by the way, you really should meet it, read it. Go to, go to Matthew and read this sermon because I'm an okay preacher, but when Jesus preaches, I mean man, right? <laughs> so really, you should listen up. But in any case, Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount eight descriptions of people who are blessed by God. And we call these the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes, attitudes that Jesus helps us to be, to become uh, more than just happy, but blessed. So let's jump right in and read together our Beatitude for the day. Jesus is going to teach us about how we can grow in so much of God's grace that we can open our eyes and look for and see beauty and truth of God in everything. And so here it is. It's on the screen. Read it with me today. Go. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Yay! Wouldn't it be a joyful thing to see God in everything we lay eyes on? God, the one who's all goodness, all love and creativity and wonder. The one who's the source of everything, all beauty and all that we enjoy here on earth. Isn't this the God that we long to see all the time? And since God is everywhere, how wonderful it would be to see God in everything. I'd be blessed indeed to live like that rather than in worry and fear and negativity and old wounds and resentment and ridiculously meaningless distractions that when I'm dead and buried won't mean a hill of beans. And in this beatitude, Jesus is saying that the way to see God is to be pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Oh, is that all? Is that all? I just have to have a pure heart. Easy peasy. Of course, I'm being like sarcastic, right? Frankly speaking, when I see words like pure heart, I get a little antsy. I get a little uneasy because, you know, I tell you all the time that I'm in 12-step recovery from drugs and alcohol. And when I was drinking and when I was using uh, drugs, I can tell you that purity would not be a word that anybody would have used to describe me. I wouldn't have even considered a word like that. And the chaos of my life and my bad attitude for the world pretty much proved what I've already said, which is what you're looking for is what you see, right? I was not looking for God, so guess what? I did not see God. Of course, time went on, and I got sober and got more of a conscience, uh, which helped me with my purity a little bit. Uh, but old habits of thinking and feeling and acting take a long time to change. I would say that for a long time, I was trying to see God, but I just couldn't find where God was. Just didn't know where he was. So where was God? I don't know. But I think it's fair to say that the one place God was not was in my heart. So I want you to hold on to that thought for just a minute. Let's talk about blessed are the pure in heart. First, what is purity? And how does it get into my heart so I can see God? I, I, honestly, there was a time when my definition of purity uh, would be something like this. Following a lot of heavy rules, uh, making sure to color uh, within all the lines of religion, um, check all the boxes in our Bible study, make sure I'm doing everything right, trying to be perfect in every way uh, that I think and I feel and I act. Um, I would have defined it as doing what somebody else said I should do somebody who knew better, like a pastor or your parents or someone like that. Uh, don't smoke, drink, or chew, or hang out with boys that do, right? <laughs> the, 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 the trouble with that definition is that I can't ever seem to do it, right? It felt like a setup to fail. So let's see how we do with looking at our heart, which is where all this purity I can never seem to attain is supposed to be, right? When Jesus said heart, he didn't mean just like romantic love or our physical, you know, boom, 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 beating heart. 
In, in the ancient times, the word heart actually described a person's entire being. Um, the emotions, the will, the mind uh, of a person, your entire personality, uh, the core and the essence of who you are, all rolled up into one word, heart. So this purity, this perfection is supposed to get into our hearts, the core of us, so we can see God. And I say, eek, how in the world is this going to happen, right? How's that going to work? Today, I realize that Jesus is complete purity. And so being pure means being like Jesus. That's what it means. Jesus is grace and truth, mercy and love, in joyful step with God and all, at all times. Jesus is our model of purity. Being pure is not about rules. It's about being like Jesus. So for you and me, when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's saying, you're blessed when you have me in your whole heart wholeheartedly, not half your heart, half-heartedly, but me in your heart, wholeheartedly. Have you ever been wholeheartedly in for something? For me, when I finally became convinced that a program of recovery was going to change my life, I became in with my whole heart for the 12 steps and sponsorship and recovery in general. I began to see the wisdom in recovery programs when I decided to throw all in and look for it. I didn't realize it at the time, but this was me being wholehearted and living out the scripture that Jesus promises, seek and ye shall find that which you seek. I kept my eyes on recovery and it was recovery that I got. In that same way, inviting Jesus into our whole heart means being all in for God wholeheartedly in other words seeking god in all we think and do and feel and are in our whole self in our heart but can we all agree that this is a struggle this is a struggle i'm sure it's not just me i'll bet you struggle with it as well in fact the apostle paul and who was an earlier early follower of jesus who struggled with the same thing the struggle's been real for a long time um, explains it this way he says it in Romans chapter 7 in the message translation um, of this passage. It's an interesting translation. He says, it happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. See, Paul is describing a heart divided. You're, you're not alone if you struggle with a divided heart heart wanting to invite Jesus into every part but instead being pulled by the influence of sin by other interests and desires that lead you to shutting Jesus out of some parts to going your own way and living like your on life on your own terms the trouble is as old as time itself in fact it might be a good idea just to ask yourself just to shed some light on it what might be some of these situations and struggles for me what are the parts of my heart that where jesus doesn't live right now the divisions in my heart the walls i've put up to shut him out in the core of my being here or there that are pulling my eyes away from jesus all around me and inside of me what are the things that make me take my eyes off of god here are a few i've known there's worry about what's to come. There's regret over what's past. There's the fear of the unknown. There's the denial about needing God in this situation or that. There's needing to be in control lest everything get out of control. There's wounds from the past that keep opening up and there's rebellion over our authority in general. Don't tell me what to do even if it's something that's good for me. Just don't tell me. There's inner certainty that it's not going to work anyway, no matter what I do. That's called despair. When my focus is on these things, they shut Jesus out of my heart. These are the things I'll see. Mostly for me, 
if I'm really honest, it's selfishness. Nobody likes to think of themselves as selfish, but someone in recovery once told me that the thing I think about the most is my God. And I had to admit that the thing I thought about the most was me. I was always looking at me, me, me. The thing I look at most when I take my eyes off of Jesus is me. I don't have Jesus in my heart. I got me in my heart. See, this is a struggle I know we all share, being wholehearted for God. But Jesus doesn't leave us alone in this struggle. See, he's there waiting in our heart to purify us precisely because we can't do it alone. As the Apostle Paul said, and we just read it a minute ago, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? And the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Yes, thank God that there's an answer, and that answer is Jesus. So what we can do is we can just ask. Friends, you can just ask. God for an undivided heart. Just ask God for an undivided heart. An undivided heart is one that is all in for Jesus. And there's only one way, there's only one way that we're going to have a heart that's all in for Jesus. And that's if Jesus lives in our hearts. See, if, if Jesus lives there, then purity will reside there. We need to ask for Jesus to be at home in our heart. Now, I know for me, I believed in Jesus way before I asked him into my heart to live there, to make me pure from the inside out. See, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. J Jesus, the pure one, is waiting to come and live in your heart, and we only need to ask. And when I ask, Jesus Christ, the wholehearted one, comes into the depths of my complications and yours, and he says mercifully, come follow me, Arlene. Come follow only me. Keep your eyes on me. Let me show you a new way of living. No, 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 no. Turn your gaze away from yourself. <laughs> no, no, no. Back to me. Good, good, good. That's better. And you'll find that your vision will become clearer. All your dividedness will begin to unite into one. I am the one, says Jesus, as you invite me, the pure one, into every room of your heart. You'll find that you, too, are becoming more and more pure yourself. And before you know it, you'll realize that you're seeing God everywhere, in everything, in everyone. So after I got sober, and when I began to see God in earnest, to try to see him in all things, God began to convict me about certain of my behaviors and thoughts and feelings. I could see where I was shutting him out many times, not wanting to live like Jesus. I, I liked the darkness too much sometimes, and the 12 steps of recovery were very helpful for me for being, bringing me more and more awareness of all the areas of my life that I could seek to be more like Jesus. And then came the day I invited Jesus into my heart. And it was then that Jesus began to do some real major renovations in there. And I began to see God in everything from the inside out. See, when God is within you, you see everything through the lens of God. And when God resides in our hearts, we begin to feel convicted about any part of our heart where we have shut him out. And even then, even when we do that, Jesus is still right there in our hearts, urging us to change and let him into that part. You know, inviting Jesus to purify all the parts of our heart as he resides there so we can see God more and more, so we can become more and more pure and wholehearted for God, so we can see God more and more is the joy of growing in our faith. There's nothing like it. It's the work of Jesus in us. And so what's our job? So our job, our job, is to practice turning our attention again and again to Jesus there in our hearts. You see, for me, I ignore my holy guest a lot. I ignore him. I run in, that, in and out of the rooms of my heart with nary a nod to Jesus sitting there. How about you? 
So we practice paying attention to Jesus there. And how? Well, we can turn to the Apostle Paul again, who gave us a great start when he said this in Philippians 4, 8 through 9. He said, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Here's the thing. Jesus' promise to us is that as we ask and pray and practice and seek, we will actually begin to see God in our day-to-day -day lives. When we ask God to help us want what God wants, see how God sees, do what God does, God will start popping up everywhere. And we'll ask ourselves, was God there all along and I just didn't see him? And the answer will be yes. Yes, the difference is that Jesus is living in every area of our hearts, purifying us so we can see God. You know, so many times in recovery nowadays, I'll talk to people who are struggling with recovery. Uh, their lives are a mess, and the only thing they can see is chaos and pain everywhere and no way out. And the thing is, I totally get it. I totally get it. I, I, remember, I, I remember fully how it felt to only see the trouble and not be able to see the hope. And so when somebody asks me to sponsor them in the program and walk them through the 12 steps, here's what I tell them. I tell them it's going to take a year probably for us to really work through these 12 steps really well and thoroughly. And I promise you, I promise you, if you stick with it, as this year progresses, you will see everything differently. The 12-step promises you'll have a spiritual awakening. God will come alive in you and you will invite him in and your life will completely change. And when I tell them this, man, I see the light come on in their eyes as hope rises up. And they inevitably ask me, how? How will my life change? This is wonderful. How will it change? And I tell them, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. But here's a few things I bet will happen. I'll bet big money you'll start to see God in other people around you, even in the people you don't necessarily like. I'll bet you'll see God in your circumstances, even in aspects of your life that up to this point you've resented and wished were different. I'll bet you'll see God in your own inner transformation as joy and peace and patience and kindness become more and more a part of your life. These are just a few of the things, but there are so many more things you'll see when Jesus moves into your heart, lock, stock, and barrel. And it's going to be amazing. And when it happens, we'll celebrate. Amen. I'm going to end with this scripture as the band comes up. And I'm not really ending, so you can take your time, band. <laughs> but be, be alert, okay? This is from the Apostle Paul, again, a prayer that he had for some fellow followers of Jesus about their hearts. I want you to listen to the prayer. It's from Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. See, Paul prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts and that you can see love and be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Makes sense, right? Makes sense. The only way to truly have a pure heart is to have a pure Jesus living there to watch over things and move you along, right? Make your heart the place where Jesus lives. Jesus will come and move in if you ask. You know, there's a little booklet that means a lot to me. And I discovered it years ago, uh, and I rediscovered it um, while reading this message, and it's called Our Heart, Christ's Home, and it, it's written in 1951 by a Presbyterian minister named Robert Munger. Now, in it, we read 
um, how Robert invites Jesus to come and live in his heart. And then he and Jesus get to know one another as Robert gives Jesus a tour of his heart, showing him all around the different rooms there. First stop, the dining room, where all the appetites for money and success live. Jesus was polite, but turned down the offer to eat there. He said he had food that, that Robert didn't see. His food was doing the will of God. Next stop was the living room, where all the talking and listening happens, and Jesus is excited about meeting with Robert all the time there. Let's meet often. And then they went on to the recreation room, where entertainment happens, much of that. Robert didn't, was really embarrassed to show Jesus <laughs> what went on there. And then there's the closet. The closet, where all of Robert's secrets live. The closet stinks. And Jesus says he just can't live with the stench. He's just going to have to go sleep out on the porch if something doesn't change in that closet. But Robert can't find the strength to clean the closet alone. So he asks Jesus to clean it out. And Jesus gladly does. And here's the last part of the booklet. Let me read it to you. This is Robert speaking. He says, then a thought came to me. I said to myself, I have been trying to keep this heart of mine clear for Christ. I start in one room, and no sooner have I, cl have I cleaned it than another room is di dirty. I begin on the second room, and the first room becomes dusty again. I'm so tired and weary of trying to maintain a clean heart and obedient life. I am just not up to it. So I ventured a question. Lord, is there any chance that you would take over the responsibility of the whole house and operate it for me? And with me, just as you did that closet, would you take the responsibility to keep my heart what it ought to be and my life where it ought to be? And I could see his face light up as he replied, certainly, that's what I came to do. You can't be a victorious Christian in your own strength. That's impossible. Let me do it through you and for you. That's the way. But, but, he added slowly, I'm not the owner of this house. I'm just a guest. I have no authority to proceed since the property is not mine. I saw it in a minute and dropping to my knees, I said, Lord, you have been a guest and I have been the host. From now on, I'm going to be the servant. You're going to be the owner and master and Lord. And running as fast as I could to the strong box, I took out the title describing the contents, the assets, the liabilities, the location, and the situation and situation and condition of the property. And I eagerly, eagerly signed it over to him and to him alone for eternity. Here I said, here it is, all that I am, all that I have forever. Now you run the house. I'll just remain with you as a servant, as a friend. And he took my life that day, and I can give you my word. There is no better way to live the Christian life. He knows how to keep it in shape, and deep peace settles down on the soul. May Christ settle down and be at home in your heart, and Lord of all. So the band's really going to come now. So, you ever notice that you see whatever you're looking for? You ever notice that? Look into your heart. Find Jesus waiting for you there. Give Jesus the keys to your kingdom. Seek his counsel and companionship in all the rooms of your heart. And the promise? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, enter in. Enter into this place and into our hearts. Enter in. And clean us up and grow us up. And then pour out the purity with which you cleanse our heart 
onto all that we see so that we can recognize God in all that we see. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open for all who wish to see Jesus more clearly. And the Robert Munger pamphlet I quoted from is up here as well. You can come and you can just get one if you'd like. It's a gift. Thank you.